Well, good morning. My name is Max. I'm on staff here. I'm thrilled you are here with us this morning, worshiping. I don't know about you, but I loved the rain yesterday. It was beautiful. I liked being able to put a sweatshirt on. That felt really good. Uh, man, it was just a great weekend and a great time this morning to gather and worship together. Would you stand as we have our call to worship from Psalm chapter 90, and then we'll worship together in song. The first two verses of Psalm 90 say this, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Think about this place, the number of generations that have come through this church, this community, this family. And he says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. This is, this is the God that we, we lean on. The one who, who was and, and is and, as we'll talk about today, is, is yet to come. And we look towards that. So would you sing with us this morning? We sing the song, The Lion and the Lamb. Sing this is coming on the clouds. It's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break. His broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the light. Roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion. Stop. 
Jesus, we worship you this morning for who you are, the ways that you work and move here at Central Park in our community. Thank you that, that these aren't just words on a paper or on a screen, but that these are, are truths about you, that you are the lamb that was slain for our sins. And we gather this morning to remember to worship and give you all the praise and the glory and the honor. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning again. My name is Max. Uh, I have this beautiful flower from Bill. Bill, where are you sitting at? Bill's over there. Is that like your usual spot? Or should I have just like known like this is where Bill always sits? Maybe No, he makes it up maybe. Uh, Bill has some beautiful flowers. You'll have to ask them what they're called because I don't know, but they're out there. You could look at them during coffee time, but what you can do after service, after your coffee's gone, is like empty your cup, maybe fill it with some water, and take some of those flowers home while supplies last, although Bill says you could go to his house and cut some, uh, or maybe if we ask nicely, he'll bring back more. Uh, but they're beautiful, so thank you for sharing those flowers. Here, Alyssa, do you want this? <laughs> she doesn't love flowers, but it looks nice. A few announcements for you. If you want to peek your head down in the student center, we ripped out almost all of the carpet and we've started laying the flooring. It's looking really nice. Uh, thanks to Brad Kane and David for helping with that. Uh, David Van Hagen. Um, and uh, so we've got it started. We're going to keep working on it as we get closer to our fall kickoff, which is September 11th. We will have our kids stuff going regularly, weekly, during worship. Uh, we do have some of our kids today, so I'll dismiss you for that later. Uh, and then youth group. On, on Sunday night starting the 11th. So we're working hard to get that finished and get that room complete. So thank you for those who have, have given both time and, and, and gifts uh, to help us complete that project. It's been going really well. You probably know this. Maybe you've got a countdown like I do, but Pastor Kevin returns from his sabbatical on the 22nd. So one more Sunday without him, and then he'll be back in the office and, and with us in worship on the 28th. So we're excited to have him back from that. I want to note this morning, uh, maybe you got the, the prayer uh, email, and if you don't, I think there's instructions on here on how to receive that, but Calvin Van Lenti has been moved to Detroit, the Regency Heights of Detroit, for physical long-term care. So uh, in a minute we'll pray, and so we'll pray for the whole Van Lenti family as they're working through this transition of Calvin out to the Detroit area. I think that is all I have by way of announcements. If I missed anything, you know where to find them here, or maybe you already read them on Friday or Saturday in preparation for, for this morning. Let's pray. God, we're in a season of change. We've been talking about it on Sunday mornings for a number of weeks now, a season where Pastor Kevin has been away, resting, studying, would you continue to be with him and Mary as they finish this, this sabbatical? That they would finish it well and come back rested, uh, ready to, to lead us along with leadership into what you have for us in this next season, this fall. Thank you for, for the ways in which uh, you have, have guided us in this renovation downstairs through through denomination help, through, through gifts that have been set aside over the years, through people giving. We thank you for the gifts and the talents that you have given us. May we always remember to, to give those back to you in return, that, that all good things come from you. Without you, we have nothing. And so we thank you for the ways that you're working and moving in our hearts and in our, our community as we seek to Im improve our building, as we seek to create a space where students can come and and know they are, they're loved and, and safe, and so we thank you for that. 
We want to pray for the Van Lenti family this morning as, as Calvin's being moved to Detroit, that you would be with them in this transition. May they, they feel your presence with them, as well as uh, their Central Park family, that they know we, we, that we love them, we care for them as they make this transition. We lift all these things up to you this morning. We thank you for the ways in which you're working and moving. We, we continue to lean on your spirit to guide us in this season and, and the one to come. Jesus, we love you, and in your name we pray. Amen. Can we stand and continue to worship a couple songs here? No, let's not do that. Let's, let's get coffee first. How about that? So let's do that. Well, let's throw three and a half minutes on the screen. Go grab coffee. Greet a neighbor. Check out those flowers, but wait until after service to take them. All right, go.
sing with us who else commands.
in our minds this morning to hear from you. Can we leave here ready to be the church? Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Kids, you can head out with Miss Jody for Central Park Kids. Test, test, test. I didn't try this before, so. Hi, my name is Pastor Kevin, and I'm back from sabbatical, and I'm excited to be here. Okay, well, maybe not. Well, he'd be excited to be, I'm not Pastor Kevin. That's the part I meant, yeah, okay. But I am glad to be here. I'm excited to share with you today, and I'm excited to be with the family of God at Central Park. Um, As today's uh, sermon unfolds, uh, we'll explore some of that together. We're in uh, the season of change, and uh, 
this is the seventh week, so some things should start to change, don't you think? Seven weeks, why not? Um, <clears throat> a couple of passages of scripture this morning. The first one is from Luke chapter 12, uh, verses 54 to 56. <clears throat> he said to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, it's going to rain, and it does. And when the south wind blows, you say, it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? What an interesting challenge. How is it that you don't know how to interpret the present time? Now, of course, the present time then was this dynamic changeover of the eons, this changeover from a, a B.C. to A.D., uh, this changeover uh, that Jesus initiates. But the Pharisees and, and the rulers of that day, the religious people of that day, were so sure of what they had that they couldn't let go enough to receive what he wanted to give. They had faith, but their faith was so structured. They were so certain of it that there was no room for anything else. And they don't even know what the present time is. Well, as I look at that, <clears throat> I also recognize that in the present time, now in 2022, it's also difficult to understand the present time. And so six weeks ago when I preached the first of this series, we talked about the season of change and, and you helped me understand some things. And so uh, this alleged book that I was going to write, um, <laughs> Uh, it'll be out about the same time as Jim's. Yeah. Um, next week. Ne yeah, next week. Next week. We just keep saying next week. Yeah, flip it up. Here's, here's the table of contents. And uh, <clears throat> with a foreword uh, through the pandemic as a lens, uh, understanding what's going on. And these are the, the uh, chapters that, uh, that you gave us to think about. And it was really helpful for me. Uh, some of these things I had never thought of. I've, I confess that I was focused on too many nitpicky things uh, and frustrated with that and couldn't see the bigger picture. And so this is really helpful. And uh, if you would write the chapters now, uh, I could have a book. Uh, and we could, you know. Uh, so. These are the things, uh, on a global scale, uh, communication, resiliency, resetting priorities, finding a comfort level, the perception of truth, and local motion, uh, having to deal with supply chain and baggage and all kinds of things. And then uh, in the second half of the book, we look at how uh, the church is affected by this, uh, the season of change in the church. And so uh, we see unchangeable foundations and servant leadership, unity, church attendance, faith above fears, and listening to the Holy Spirit with an epilogue on hope as the lens through which we look forward. Hope as the lens. And so that ties a little bit then with uh, what I want to talk about today, what I want us to think about as we look uh, at the book of Hebrews. We're looking at uh, the 11th chapter of Hebrews, and, uh, and it talks about faith. Uh, and, and it was a helpful study for me uh, to, to see faith in a fresh way. Um, there are times when I've thought of faith uh, mainly as belief. As a pastor, uh, when people come to make confession of faith, 
we especially have our ears tuned and the elders, as they meet with them, have their ears tuned to hear, well, what do you believe and when's Jesus coming forth in this? Are we going to hear about your giving, surrendering your life to Christ? Are, are we going to hear that? And do you have your beliefs right? And that's a part of faith. But there are other pieces to faith. Uh, perseverance is a part of that. And trust is a part of that. And, and I've discovered that faith is much more elastic than I think. Uh, sometimes I want to package it and say it's a, it's a specific substance, it's a specific thing, and you either have it or you don't, and you have it, and some people have it in abundance, and some people seem to have it all the time, and it's much more elastic than that. And there's some give and take on it and some, some now and then to it as well. There seems to be a substance to it in that Jesus said if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could move mountains. There's a paradox in there of uh, how little it takes to move a mountain. And yet, I haven't moved any mountains. Hmm. So how much does it take? Well, I've got less than a mustard seed, and that's what I'm working with. Hmm. So is it amount? Is it timing? Is it kind? Um, there were a couple other times when Jesus <clears throat> talks about faith, and, and the two that I recall uh, are women. The woman who comes uh, for healing and touches the hem of his garment, and he turns and says to her, your faith has healed you. It's a woman. And her faith healed her. Faith brought about healing. How much? A grain of, I don't know. And yet it's there. So, so we hear uh, about it in that way. In chapter 11, it's called the faith chapter often, faith in action. Here are the first couple verses. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Faith is confidence in what we hope for. So, Again, it's, it's elastic. It's confidence in what we hope for. I mean, and, and hope is also something that's not a constant, not you can't do this. You, it's hope. When Paul writes in the Corinthians, he says, faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And actually, love is the one that's going to continue. We need faith and hope in this life un until the second coming or until we enter glory. Faith and hope are important. They're vital for us. But once we're there, then the need for faith, the need for hope is, is finished. Love will abide. Love will continue. But faith, hope, they've done their job. But they're vital to us now as well as love. But faith and hope are what get us through. Are what? And they're connected in that myst <laughs> mystical way. Faith is confidence in what we hope for. Assurance of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And of course, if, if you've read this chapter before, you know that he goes on then to talk about what happens by faith. And, and as he names people, sometimes you know more of the story than is named. And you recognize that, okay, by faith this happened, but they weren't a perfect person. They had failings. They had other things going on in their life. But by faith... God accomplished what he wanted to. 
And that's encouraging. Because if God can only use me in those good moments, in those perfect moments, it gets real short. He just has little bits of time. If any, if any at all, for those who know me well. Um, <clears throat> so, confidence in what we hope for, assurance in what we do not see, this is what the ancients were commended for. So then he goes, by faith, Abel. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. And Abraham gets called on a number of times because he has a long life of faithfulness and God does lots of things through his life. Turn one too many pages. Then we're up to verse 13. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Again, the mystery of faith, of what it leads to, of where it's going, of how it comes to fruition. And then it goes on. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Isaac. By faith, Jacob. By faith, Joseph. By faith, Moses. By faith, Moses. By faith, the people leaving Egypt. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed spies. Um, up to verse 32. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. It comes later. It's a promise. It's part of the mystery. Faith, in some cases, gave them a victory in life. And in other cases, they experienced death or torture. Then we get to therefore in chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, a great cloud of people who have testified, who have left their mark. When I think of 
Traditioned innovation, which is also part of the title of this series and a phrase that most of us are not familiar with. Traditioned innovation is based on the idea that uh, you may try new things, but you're wise to consider your history. You're wise to consider your tradition and what's worked before and what's worked be, uh, and what not, has not worked, uh, what people respond to. We've done that in some ways by being intentional about food. We eat well. We serve each other food well, that kind of thing. So that as we look for fresh things to do, we tie it to old things. The cloud of witnesses is unique to each church. And so the cloud of witnesses from chapter 11 is something that every church claims. But this church has its own cloud of witnesses. Hmm. Help me, if you will, to uh, remember some of that cloud of witnesses going back at least a generation, maybe more, or maybe even our generations, uh, people who have uh, past, who have died, and now live in, who died in the promise and now live in that present, who died with faith. Help me with that, would you? I, th I, th I think of some because I've been around a little bit and, and some names are familiar and, and Ken uh, passed away a year ago? Not quite a year ago. Okay, I usually am three years off. So, uh, yeah, so, so Ken is one. Uh, Roger passed away five years ago. Five years ago. Five years ago. Yeah, Roger Doolittle. Um, uh, others uh, who have passed from this congregation. Help me with this. Virgin Cy White. Virgin Cy White. Uh, uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Great tie in because you see, and you're reminded of other people as we're doing, as we're doing ministry today. Egg Brink, you said, and Casey Ong. Uh, you know. So, who else are you reminded of or do you think of? One at a time. Don Van Ark, yes. Mary DeVries. John Tavray. John Tavray. Yeah. Oh, Tavray. Mm -hmm. John Tavray. I was in choir with him, I think, in <laughs> 1970-whatever. When was that, Barb? 70-something. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. yeah. He, he always wanted to sing a certain song. I, that's what I remember. Anyway, yeah, good. Alvin Heiss. Alvin Heiss, yeah, the Van Heiss. Dupre. Genevieve. Genevieve Dupre. Henry and Mary Munson. Okay, Henry and Mary. Roscoe DeVries. Roscoe DeVries. Yeah. Mary Sayer. Mary Sayer. Mary Sayer. <coughs> Paul Struer. Huh? Paul Struer. Paul Struer. I, uh, <clears throat> I looked at the windows in preparation for this to see who they were dedicated to, and uh, it was partly names I knew and, and some I didn't. Uh, a Helmick is back there, and I immediately thought of Cease and Shirley, but the family is there. Anybody else? Vi Richardson. Vi Richardson. Uh-huh. Yeah. I didn't hear it. Karen Holmes. Yeah. Phoebe Struger. Phoebe Struger. 
Edie Druger. Yeah. Randy Zeda. Randy Zeda. Viola Kuypers. Viola Kuypers? Mm-hmm. Evelyn Stringholt. Evelyn Stringholt. Van Puttens. Many of you are nodding as you hear the name. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. We need to be reminded of the cloud of witnesses. Not that they dictate what we do, but they were a part of who we are. The cloud of witnesses is not necessarily in a balcony watching, but they've had influence as a witness to their own faith in God. And so they inform us. They inform us. And celebrate with us. I left off the last verse. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. While we remember the cloud of witnesses, they spur us on to do this, to follow Jesus, to run the race, <laughs> fixing our eyes on Jesus who is the pioneer and perfecter of faith, leading the way and perfecting the way so that this promise becomes real, comes to fruition. It still only comes to fruition after death. We don't get to see it in all of its glory. We're a step closer, if you will, than the Old Testament prophets and, and others but it's still perfected by Jesus through his death and then made effective through ours. Run the race with perseverance. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word to us, for your encouragement to us to run a race, to follow you, and that you've gone before us, and you have the word of encouragement for us. You have the final word. So we pray that you would make yourself known to us in a very real way. As individuals, as we run this race, and as and as a church, as we run this race, and try to see what next steps would be. You've set it out before us. We look to you, and we pray that it would be clear. Give us a vision, and then courage, because it's never easy. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and, and sing in response to the song, Build My Life. Yeah.
Go now as the people of God. You have a firm foundation. You have a pioneer and perfecter leading the way. Go now. Finish the race. In Jesus' name, amen.